Hey, it is a Tiki Technical Tuesday, part, I don't know. It is Tiki Technical Tuesday, and we have got to glaze some birds. That's right, we are at the sixth and final episode of How to Make a Slipcast Mug, the story of the rhinoceros hornbill. We have got a bazillion bisked mugs. That means that they have been fired once, and they are hard, but not completely solid. They still have some porosity, which means that they are ready to accept that magical thing that we call glaze. That's right, this episode is all about glaze and its little known family friend, underglaze. So it all started here months and months ago with the first castings out of the mold. I marked them as APs or artist proofs and I used those to dial in the look, the glaze, the look in the feel, the colors that I want for the final finished fired mug. Now, why did I think about this months and months ago? Because I have to order all of those colors, I have to make sure they exist, and I have to just kind of make sure that we can achieve what I have in my mind. And guess what? We did. Woo! Here it is, the final look for the rhinoceros hornbill mug. Now, this look involves two different things. It involves glaze, and it also involves underglaze. What's the difference? I'm so glad you asked. Okay, so underglaze, even though it has glaze in the name, is not glaze. Get that out of your head. It is actually slip. It is ceramic slip. It's very similar to the stuff that we make the mugs themselves out of, but it has a color added to it. Here we have some velvet underglazes. It is the glaze. It is the underglaze that I use in the studio here all the time. And if we look inside, we will see that this bright orange is in fact bright orange. Uh, there's a saying in um, web development, it's called WYSIWYG, and it stands for what you see is what you get. And in fact, as you can see, here it is, the bright orange, ooh, I'm dripping. It looks exactly the same after you fire it. That's because this slip, this ceramic slip, this underglaze has a mineral mixed into it that will stay the same color when you fire it. Um, it's pretty incredible stuff. Now, there are a couple of caveats. First, even though that it says it'll stay the same color all the time, that's not always the case. As you get higher and higher in temperature in your kiln, the colors may shift. Now, the reason I like Amico is they're very honest about this and they have a PDF that you can download on their website that shows the colors at say a cone 04, a cone 4, a cone 5, a cone 6, all the way up to a cone 10. So you can see that some of their colors do change. So even after looking at that chart, always do a test on your own uh, before you fire. Second caveat is the finish. This is in fact an underglaze. Why do they call it that? because the surface finish is not so hot. It is not food safe. It's gonna be rough and feel a little gritty. Uh, in fact, Amico is very clever and then they call this a, a velvet underglaze. It's a clever marketing technique to make you think that that velvet surface, that fired surface is intentional. It's not, that's just the way that all underglazes will look. Um, this little test fellow has a coat of a satin clear glaze over it to make it food safe. So if you are gonna use velvet underglazes in your studio, You've got to cover them if you're going to have any food come in contact with them. Okay, so that was underglaze. What about glaze? I'm so glad you asked. Alrighty, we have got some ceramic glaze here. This is very different than underglaze. It is glaze. It is a finely ground glass, basically, that's going to coat your piece, and it's got a bunch of other magical goodies in it that will change its color. It's going to do a lot of crazy stuff. The main thing to remember with glaze is it is not WYSIWYG. It is WYSI wigand. It's, it is not what you see, is what you get. For example, this color, Mako uh, SW164 Satin Patina. It's a beautiful one. Huh? Look at that gorgeous color. Pretty gross, right? It looks like... Um, I don't know, cement gray, but when you fire it, it ends up looking like this. It changes color completely in the kiln. Now this can be very confusing when you're glazing because you'll paint your piece and it looks like this and you put it in the kiln that comes out like this. So you never really know what you're gonna get unless you do a lot of tests before you fire. Now glazes can vary incredibly. Um, I have another glaze that looks almost identical to this in the container, but when you fire it, it turns out like this. It's a completely different look. Um, so you've got to really think ahead when you're glazing. Um, 
because what you see is not what you get when you open up that kiln. That's glaze. Oh, and really quick, I use prepared glazes in the studio. I do this for a couple of reasons. Uh, by prepared, I mean they're store-bought. You buy them like this, they're already mixed and they're ready to use. I do this for a couple of reasons. One, I know they're food safe, I, they're certified food safe. And two, um, I just don't have the patience for glaze mixing and testing. I have a lot of respect for ceramic artists that really enjoy that process. And I can understand how you can dive deep into that process of formulating your own glazes. There's a lot of incredible books out there about how to make your own glazes. It's, it's kind of just not my jam, really. I'm not into it. I like, I like getting as close to WYSIWYG with glazes as I can get, so I know I can look at this container. I see the color. Um, I do some tests in my studio, and I, I kind of know what I'm going to get pretty quickly as opposed to mixing my own glazes. Um, that being said, it's something you can totally do in your studio if you want. It's just not something that I'm into. Believe it or not, I used to feel a little ashamed about using pre-made glazes in the studio. Like, I'm not a real ceramic artist because I use a store-bought glaze. Um, I've gotten over that. I, I don't feel any shame about it anymore. I realize I'm a production potter and I need to have consistency in my pieces. And um, it is just kind of gatekeeping for people to say because you use that tool or you use that technique that you're not a real artist or whatnot. I try not to let that get into my head and I just enjoy making the things I make. At least that's what I try to do. All right, so that was glaze and underglaze. Now that we know what they are, we've got to figure out how we're going to get them onto this. Now, this is the look that I love. This is the look that we ended up going with. And it's a delicate dance of how to apply them and at what time. It's kind of a chicken and the egg situation. I know that the color in my head that I want to achieve, but you have to layer these materials on top of each other and figuring out the best order to apply. Now, in this case, I decided that we were going to do a bit of a sandwich. We're going to do a glaze, underglaze, glaze sandwich. The first application will be glaze, and we're going to put glaze on the inside of the mug. Now, fortunately, uh, Mrs. Van Tiki is my studio partner, and she opted to tackle doing the insides of the mug. So we will just cut to that right now. Okay, here we are at uh, Miss Van Tiki's uh, glaze setup. It is in the laser room. So yeah, you can see there's the laser back there. Here's a bazillion boxes that we need for shipping. Um, yeah, so uh, she is usually in here glazing the insides while she's running the laser. The reason I have no footage of that is because while she's doing that, I am always in the spray booth spraying either under glaze or glaze the next steps of the process, which we will just get to. So just pretend you see Denise here. Uh, she is putting glaze inside of each mug, um, and it's, it's just looking great. Unfortunately, I, I don't have any video of it, so we'll just move along. Welcome to the glaze room. This is where I store all of the stuff ready to be glazed. This is where I store all of my glaze tests, all of my glaze itself, and most importantly, my glaze booth. I absolutely love this spray booth. It is one of the biggest things that I invested in when we moved here to Oregon after the slip table uh, and of course the kiln. I did most of my spraying in my backyard in Hawaii and uh, I always had neighbors peeking over the fence trying to figure out what I was doing. It just was messy so it's great to have a dedicated space now this is not an inexpensive piece of machinery uh, but it's invaluable to me i find that spraying is the most um, effective way for me to glaze i love the look of sprayed glazes and it's very fast it, and it, it, uh, it usually the glazes usually turn out really well uh, now just like han solo i have made several modifications to my spray booth uh, to help it work even better let me take you through them First up, it's all about lighting. I got these little flexible lamps from Ikea. They were inexpensive and very bright, and I attached them to the studio using, believe it or not, a uh, chopping board that I cut up. It's a nice plastic, which makes it easy to clean. I use stainless steel hardware, and the chopping board gives me lots of uh, room to maneuver the lights around depending on what I'm glazing. I put three of them on the booth, and uh, it's just great. Nice uniform lighting. I also went in and attached this stainless steel, I guess like bolt bracket thing. It's fantastic for hanging the spray gun up in. Um, just really easy. It's uh, better than hanging it up outside of the booth. It's just very ergonomic. I put a little loop on the end of my air hose, which lets me hang it up outside of the booth when I have it disconnected from the gun. And that air hose runs upstairs to 
to here. This is the storage space up above a uh, section of the studio. I use this for storing shipping boxes. Uh, the studio heater is up here. And more importantly, the studio compressor is up here. So yeah, the hose, it comes out through the top of the spray booth and attaches to this compressor. I've also got an outlet up here, a very special dedicated outlet, which leads us to here to the special switch, which is magical. Uh, the best thing about uh, having the studio built to our specs is I could make a dedicated switch for the blower that's sucking the air, wait for it, that is sucking the air out through uh, the top of the spray booth. And then I also have a second switch for the compressor upstairs. Ha -ha. Way better than going up and down, you know, turn that thing on and off. Of course, you cannot discuss spray booths without discussing spray guns. Now, this is a question that I get all the time when I post in that is what kind of gun are you using? Uh, so I usually kind of don't talk about it that much because well, one, it took me forever to find a gun that I liked, and then I got kind of like defensive of that gun. It's an expensive gun. Well, ah, let's just let's just start at the beginning of the story, and that is my first spray gun, and that would be this. It is from, I believe, Harbor Freight. Uh, it is a HVLP gun. That means it is a high volume, low pressure gun. In fact, these are both HVLP guns. That means I can use kind of a standard compressor, and they put out a lot of material uh, using a relatively low PSI. Now, this gun from Harbor Freight did great, and I know lots of ceramic folks that use this and love this gun, or a similar gun to this. Uh, a couple of key things to note about this type of gun. It is a gravity feed gun, meaning that the glaze sits up here in this reservoir on the top, and gravity pulls it down into the gun. Air is going this way and shooting out, and gravity is pulling the glaze down in here. They combine and spray out the front of the gun. I have got on the bottom a small pressure regulator that allows me to control the pressure of the air coming into the gun. Using your compressor's regulator to adjust air is really a pain in the butt because you have to keep running back to your compressor to adjust it. And also I think that it can be uh, not quite as accurate as one right at the point of the gun. Now, I used this for years, like I said, but it had some problems. One, uh, being gravity fed, you can't have too thick of a liquid in here or else it won't properly flow out of the nozzle. Now, let me tell you what a thick liquid is. A thick liquid is glaze. Glazes are super thick, so I ended up having to water them down a lot to get them to spray correctly, and that really affected the coating and the look of the glaze. I wanted something better, and I found that something better Watching an episode of Craft in America on PBS, they featured the Motavi Tile Works and they showed their glazing setup and they were using a gun that looked entirely different than the gun that I was using at the time. It had the container on the bottom. It had a weird little tube connecting to that container um, and I was intrigued. So I did a lot of research and called a lot of people and ended up with this. This is a CA Technologies Lynx HVLP pressure fed spray gun. And I love this thing to death. This is actually designed to spray abrasive materials like ceramics. Ceramics glazes are abrasive. They're little particles of ground glass as we discussed. So they can put a lot of wear and tear on a spray gun. The needle of this gun is made out of tungsten carbide, which means it will not erode away as the glaze is shooting out past it. Uh, it's, I mean, glaze effectively is sandblasting your your spray gun as you're using it. Now, you'll notice that the, the thing is on the bottom of this. I love it. So what happens is air is not only going up here and shooting out the front, air is also going in here. I've got a, two regulators. I've got a regulator for the spray going into here, and I've got a regulator going for the pressure into here. And that pressure is going in here and it's squeezing that glaze up and pushing it through like, a, like it's grabbing a toothpaste tube and it's pushing the glaze up and out of the gun. And that means that I can use thick glaze. I can usually use commercial glazes like this right out of the container. I don't have to thin them out or anything. I just blurp, put them right in there and fire away. It's fantastic. But wait, there's more. 
Like I said, this gun is like squeezing a tube of toothpaste to get the glaze through the gun. And that tube is this little polypropylene bag. Well, I think it's polypropylene. I don't know. But it's this great little bag that's easy to take in and out. And it has a um, like this little sieve on the top, a little screen to keep any particles and nasty stuff from going through your gun. And it's really quick and easy to interchange these. So I keep them labeled with all the glazes and underglazes that I'm using on a project. And I can swap them out just so fast, so easy easy and so convenient. Perhaps the best feature of all is the fact that since the paint container down here is pressurized, it doesn't matter what orientation the gun is in. You can spray with this gun upside down, sideways, any which way you want. That is a huge improvement over gravity-fed guns, which always have to be upright to work properly. So there you have it. That is my weapon of choice in the spray booth, the CA Technologies gun. I will try to put a link to this one in the description of the video. Now, I want to say that this is an expensive piece of machinery. I spent a lot of money on this tool, and often when people ask me what type of spray gun I use, and I tell them that I use this one, they'll come back and be like, whoa, man, that's expensive. Yes, it is, because I need a tool that is reliable, that works well, that can spray thick glazes. It checks all of the boxes, and it works wonderfully for me. That being said, I used this one for many years and it worked great too. I know several artists that still use these to, that, that being said, I used this one for many years. I know several artists that have used them for decades and they don't see any need to switch to a different gun like this. It's a personal preference thing. Feel free to experiment, find a tool that works for you and go with it. That being said, let's go spray some underglaze. Woo! Alrighty, Miss Van Tiki has kindly done the interiors on a whole new shelf of mugs. We've got, I think, 44 mugs on the shelf. That is what fits in the kiln, and that is what we're going to start on right now with some underglaze. We are going to coat the entire surface of this bird with a beautiful terracotta velvet underglaze. Before I hit the booth, I uh, line the inside of the mugs with a little strip of uh, craft paper. Um, this keeps me from getting uh, glaze on my fingers, or sorry, underglaze on my fingers, and then onto the inside of the mugs, which is something that I want to avoid while spraying. In the booth, I am just putting a nice, even single coat of underglaze onto the mug. Uh, I hold it like this so that I can get all different angles. Uh, angle is really important when you're using a spray gun. It's a gun. It's shooting this paint out in particles in a very directional spray. So you've got to make sure that you either move the gun or the piece around to make sure that you cover every single angle of the sculpture. Okay, there we go. We've got them all covered nicely with underglaze. And guess what's next? We're gonna wipe it all off. I know, I know it sounds crazy, but I want these things to look old and ancient. So I want to do what's called a wash. Um, so I'm gonna put all the glaze on, which, or sorry, underglaze. We put all the underglaze on, and now I'm gonna wipe it off of just the high areas. I'm gonna leave it in the low areas. So it's gonna basically be like a layer of dirt that's kind of like worn into these ancient skulls. To wipe off the underglaze, I use these heavy-duty sponges. I cut it in half to make it easier. And I also need a big bucket of water, plus the final optional ingredient, and that is a TV in the studio to put something on to keep your mind off of the kind of uh, repetitive task of wiping off all of this underglaze. Now, I'm going to be honest, the Lord of the Rings show didn't quite grab my intention, at least not as well as this sponge grabbed the underglaze. Ha, <laughs> it's a little ceramics joke for you. Anyway, I start by wiping away all of the bottom of the mug, and this will really kind of really show the bottom signature on the mug and the detail of the addition number. And then we move on to the rest of it. I'm just wiping it away from the raised areas. Remember, I want this to look like dirt that is trapped in the nooks and crannies of this ancient skull. So, we leave the stuff in the cracks there and we wipe off everything else. Once we have all the terracotta underglaze wiped away, it's time to do some masking. We are going to use painter's tape to mask off areas of this mug that we 
don't want to cover with underglaze on this next pass. For the next pass, I'm going to be putting underglaze on the beak in some very bright colors, and I don't want those colors to end up anywhere else. First off, I tape off the bottom of the mug and then carefully peel the tape away so only the bottom section of the mug is covered. Once that is done, it is time to take even more tape. Now I'm gonna lay this down on the table because I'm making a little template, a little measuring template. I'm gonna use a tape measure and I'm gonna mark this off into three equally long sections uh, that I'm gonna use as a guide because I'm using my new favorite tool for masking and that is this crazy thing that is both table paper or like a craft paper attached to painter's tape. Look at this thing, it's incredible. And I can roll this out on my table, but, but, Bup, bup. And then using the little marks that I made on my little uh, guide, my reference guide, I can cut this paper into three even sections, which are perfectly length to uh, tape around one of these mugs. Here we go. Of course, the goal here is to leave only the beak exposed. So uh, this paper is going to be covering the skull so I don't get any underglaze onto the skull. So I'm carefully setting this tape down around the edge of the beak. There you go. Okay, buckle up. This is gonna need three different colors to complete the beak, and we start with the yellow, and you can see this is why I love these little pouches. It just makes it so fast and easy. You'll especially notice it when we switch colors. First coat is just the tip of the beak. Uh, the actual very tip of the beak and the horn is white, so I'm leaving the exposed clay there, which will fire to a white color. We switch over to the orange, which is gonna be slightly farther back. I'm being very careful with the direction of the spray to get a nice Nice feathered transition from yellow to orange. And then, hey, we're on to red, the final color of the beak, which is the most careful one to spray. I just want it on the very back part of it. There we go. We have got all of them colored, and they are looking fantastic. All right, we've got all three colors of underglaze applied to the beaks. Haha! -ha! And it's time for the final underglaze step, perhaps the most tedious of all the underglaze steps. But first we need to remove this masking. All right, so what are we gonna focus on? We are going to focus on the transition point between the beak and the skull. Now, when you look at the beaks and the skulls of these actual birds, they have this weird kind of black line that acts like, like it acts, I guess it's like a barrier. I don't, I am not a, bird anatomist, anatomist, I don't even know. I don't know anything about bird anatomy, but I do know that they have that line. So I actually kind of sculpted it in. That's what this weird little squiggle is between the beak and the skull portion. And so we are going to put black underglaze on this transition area. That'll be the final bit of underglaze that we do before we get into glaze. I'm gonna be using black underglaze in this kind of dipping sauce lid container and some very, very, very fine brushes. So we have put a lot of time into putting underglaze onto these mugs and the last thing I wanna do is flub it by messing up with this black underglaze. So I'm really being extra, extra careful. Ah, okay, so there we go. Ta-da! This is by far the most time-consuming part of these because it's hand applied by brush. Um, I knew it would take a while, but I just couldn't figure out a way to mask this quickly. So this, I think, is the fastest and most efficient way to do it. Now, um, I should say that when I did the first one, it took forever. Uh, I'm up to like number 55 now, so I'm getting faster. I guarantee by the time I get to number 200, I will be much faster than I am now. It's just a practice thing. You just get better with practice. So let's put this aside and do the next one. Okay, so now it is time for the final part of our glaze, underglaze, glaze sandwich. We started with glaze on the inside of the mug. We've done underglaze for the yellow, the orange, the red, and the black. And now it's time for glaze again. And for the glaze, a final maneuver, we're covering the entire thing with a glaze that turned out to be a little tricky. And by a little tricky, I mean exceptionally tricky. We are going to be using Amico Salt Buff PC60 to coat the entire surface of the mug. Now, why is this extremely tricky? Little did I know when I selected this at the beginning of the year to do the final coat on these mugs that Amico was planning on discontinuing this glaze. So I've had to scour the country uh, and get 
as much glaze as I could find, you know, on shelves collecting dust of ceramic shops in multiple states and ship it all here. So hopefully I have found enough of this discontinued glaze to finish out the edition. I think I'm okay, um, but it's a little stressful. Back to the spray booth. We are going to do one final coat, and this is the final glaze coat. We're doing an even very, very light coat over the entire surface of the mug. Don't panic. This is glaze, not underglaze. It's going to change color. Okay, we are so close to done. It is painful, and, and I mean that. The more time you invest into a piece, it just feels all the more stressful that you might mess it up along the process. I mean, we've been working on these for a long, long time. We cast them like well over a month ago. They've gone through several firings. Uh, we have had to, well, I guess only one firing so far. Then we did glaze on the inside. We did underglaze on the outside in multiple colors. And then this final coat. Um, we've got a lot of time invested into these and I worry about dropping these 10 times more after every step that I put into them. It, it, it's crazy. Anyway, we gotta do one final thing on these before we put them in the kiln and that is we have to wipe their bottoms. Settle down, it's not what you think. I'm talking about the mug bottoms, uh, specifically the glaze that we got onto the mug bottoms. Now technically under glaze will not stick to kiln shelves but glaze will. Once this goes into the kiln, it's going to melt and turn basically into liquid glass. So we have to get all of the glaze off of the foot or the bottom part of the mug that touches the kiln shelf. There we go. This one is ready to fire. Now we just have to do 22 more. All right, after wiping all 22 more of them, uh, it was time to load them into the kiln. Now, this is, again, a very delicate process. As I mentioned earlier, the last thing I want to do is drop one of these or chip one of these or just mess them up in any way. We've just got so much time invested into them. Okay, we've got them all loaded, and the kiln is not quite full. I will admit that this is, this is really a two-thirds of a kiln load. I could put more in, but I just don't have any ready right now, and we want to get these fired and shipped as soon as possible. So I'm going to close this and you will see the chemical reaction. Well, you're not gonna see it because I will not have a camera in here while it's firing, but we're gonna open this up in two days and hopefully we'll see these things looking quite different. All right, here we are after firing at 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit or 1,200 degrees Celsius for you European viewers. This is the magic that happens, the chemistry of heat and science. We've got mugs! Here they are, finished, and behold the incredible transformation that that final coat of glaze does in the kiln. It becomes, in the, when used in a single coat, it becomes transparent, it gets glossy over this uh, heavily underglazed section, and then it's a little more satin to matte over the bone section where it's just over the natural clay. And also it behaves very differently as it builds up. Sometimes it does this kind of neat kind of, I guess you could call this like a an old onion skin, or is this like a orange orange peel, I guess would be the term for that. I don't know, but it does this great effect on that, which I love because it's kind of random. They will look different as I work through the addition, which is something I really wanted for these. I like the idea that these are antique collections. This bird passed away in the jungle. Maybe this one laid in a pile of leaves. Maybe this one fell into some mud. So they're going to, they're gonna age differently, which I love. These are each unique, and I think that makes them very special. And that brings us here to this wall of boxes in our shipping room, where all of these birds will be going into these boxes and then shipping to the homes of folks who pre-ordered one. Wow, it has been quite the journey to go from a lump of clay to these finished mugs. I wanna thank you all for joining me on the Rhinoceros Hornbill adventure. And I'd like to say an extra big thank you to everyone who pre-ordered one of these birds and has been patiently waiting to get one in the mail. Um, this was a big addition for us. 350 mugs was a lot. Now, we had thought that this would be good to do a big addition like this because then we could get more birds to folks who wanted them. But it turns out for the two of us, it is an awful lot for us to produce. So in the future, we will not be doing additions this big. Um, if we do an addition of 300, we'll break it into chunks of like 100 mugs each batch so that folks aren't waiting too long and that we don't go insane trying to get so many, so many mugs through our tiny studio at once. As you can see, 
it's a little overwhelming. At any rate, thank you for watching. If you have not subscribed, oh my god, please subscribe. It means the world to me. And uh, click like, and better yet, tell a friend that you think might enjoy this about watching it. Uh, I will put all the links in the comments or the description of the video below to things like where you can get the spray gun, um, that fancy little tape thing that I love, all that good stuff. At any rate, thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next episode of Tiki Technical Tuesday. Oh.